Welcome to Module 2, Part 0. In this module, we are going to discuss open steady devices, especially some specific, de specific devices such as turbine, compressor, pump, etc., which we are going to encounter in chapters 8 through 11 throughout the rest of the modules. We're going to also cover PC and PG model briefly, uh, which are necessary to handle different fluids passing through the devices. We'll understand the meaning of thermodynamic diagram, especially with respect to internally reversible devices. And we'll also define isentropic efficiency of a device. The prereq for this chapter, for this module, is chapter 2 review. It's in module 1, part 0. And that, that goes into the meaning of governing equations. So here we are not going to discuss the meaning. Instead, we are going to jump into a generic open steady device. This is a screenshot of an animation for a single flow generic device. As you can see, the system is open because mass is allowed to be transferred across the boundary. And the boundary is shown by the red dashed line. You can also see heat transfer indicated here. And external work transfer in terms of shaft, electricity, and boundary work. So it's a generic open system. Now, why do we call this system steady? Or how do you figure out when a system is steady or not? Well, the different color inside the system is used here to show that state of the local system can change from point to point. Here the system may be cold, here the system may be hot, but when the system is steady, it means at a given point, the state doesn't change. So if this is hot, this will remain hot forever. If this is cold, it will remain cold forever. And this is a very big significance because suppose you are calculating the total energy of the system so you break the system into small pieces, into pixels, find the energy of each little individual pixels, add them up. That's the total stored energy of the system. But the system is steady means none of these small local systems are changing with time. As a result, the total energy of the system will never change with time. And therefore, the energy will, you know, the DEDT, the rate of change of energy with time will become zero because the energy remains constant. Likewise, dmdt will be zero, dsdt will be zero. So these differential governing equations become algebraic, a very major simplification. So we're going to apply these equations now to simpler systems, let's say specific systems, say a turbine. So we draw a turbine here. State 1 is the inlet, state 2 is the exit. And we don't care whether it's a steam turbine or a gas is flowing through the turbine. It doesn't matter in this case. So what is the, our mass equation for this device? As you can see, steady state means this goes to zero. The mass going in equals mass coming out, so we can just reduce one unknown. We can just call it m dot. The energy equation is similarly what energy transported by mass, energy transported out by mass, heat transferred into the system, and the external work that is coming out of the system. Now suppose we call the turbine work as W dot T. So this is the generic energy, uh, energy equation. To simplify it for the turbine, we set the steady state condition. And let's say it's an adiabatic turbine. In other words, the turbine is insulated. Most of the time, this is so. So the energy equation simplifies to M dot j1 minus j2 and the external work is obviously only the shaft work which is we can write w dot t 
W dot T is a positive number, whereas W dot external is an algebraic quantity. As you can see, in this case, work is coming out. So therefore, by the win hip convention, work in negative, heat in positive. We know that W dot T would be a positive number, so we don't have to add any sign here. So the turbine work reduces to m dot j1 minus j2 and it's intuitive look at this the turbine work is the energy that is flowing with the mass minus the energy that is leaving the turbine the difference is the turbine work and an important simplification is if the kinetic and potential energy can be neglected we can write the formula as m dot h1 minus h2 and this is something we are going to routinely do so we can just take a look at the device and say, look, the energy entering here is m dot times h1. Energy leaving is m dot times h2. So what should be the turbine work? So without going into the energy equation, just by looking at the, uh, the sketch of the turbine, we can write this equation quite confidently. So this will be something that we'll be doing all the time. So let's go apply that concept for a compressor so here i am drawing the sketch of a compressor and let's see without writing the governing equations can we figure out the compressor equations so the in a compressor we know that compressor power is going into it as a shaft and compressing the vapor or gas from state one to state two so of course the mass flow rate cannot change for a steady system m dot going in m dot coming out how much energy will be carried in here m dot h1 and m dot h2 would be the energy that is coming out of the compressor and w dot c is the compressor power is a positive number so would you agree we are pouring energy in in terms of shaft work or compressor work and again the compressor is assumed to be adiabatic no heat transfer so therefore the energy that goes in and energy that comes out the energy coming out with the mass will be higher because we are transferring work into the compressor so does it make sense to write down compressor work will be m dot h2 minus m dot h1 yes it does so if you use the energy equation you can come back to the same conclusion from scratch and note about the entropy equation we didn't do it for the turbine but let me quickly write it for the compressor again the entropy balance is given by the entropy equation Steady state means entropy of the system of the compressor cannot change with time. Adiabatic means no heat transfer and no entropy transfer by heat. So therefore, we can write, we can just transfer, manipulate the equation to write S1 equals, S2 equals S1 plus. So, what we can conclude is that entropy at 2 and entropy at 1 are kind of related by this equation, whereas S dot gen is a reflection of how much friction is there in the system. If you go back to chapter 2, we have covered what S, dead, S dot gen means. This means thermodynamic friction, not just physical, mechanical friction. It could be friction due to temperature difference, friction due to chemical difference any difference that is destroyed in a system causes thermodynamic friction but in an ideal compressor one can say well friction is almost not there and in the limit when friction is zero then as you can see entropy become equal so for frictionless an adiabatic turbine or compressor if these two conditions are met then S2 equals S1. The system becomes isentropic. Well, let's carry on the same analysis for a pump 
or the formula for a pump, what happens in a pump is just like a compressor except it handles a liquid, the energy that comes in, energy then goes out, and that goes out. So therefore, the pump work is given by So as you can see, in each case, the work transfer is expressed in terms of an enthalpy difference. So it will be very important that we learn how to figure out enthalpy difference uh, for a vapor, for a liquid, for a gas, etc. Okay, so here, uh, let's do one more analysis before we go into how to evaluate properties of a gas or a phase change model. Let's say we have a tube in which a fluid is flowing. It could be a liquid, it could be a gas. Look, our question is, what is the heat transfer? Again, m dot h1 will be the energy carried by the mass. m dot h2 is the energy carried by the mass at the exit. And suppose the heat transfer is given by q dot in. Without going into the energy equation, you should be able to write. Does it make sense? Because as I heat, the energy that leaves will be higher than energy that enters by mass. Again, we are neglecting kinetic and potential energy. They're usually very, very small compared to the enthalpy of the fluid. Okay. One more thing. As I heat the fluid, what do you think happens to the pressure? The, 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 the common refrain, the common answer is, a lot of lay people will say, oh, you're heating the fluid, so therefore the pressure must be increasing. Well, let's think for a second. Let's take the free body diagram of the fluid that is trapped at a given moment. So how do you draw a free body diagram? It, Suppose it's a liquid, let's simplify the problem. So you take the lump of liquid, a cylindrical volume of liquid, and we are doing a free body diagram. What happens on this cross section? So we took the, we isolated the fluid. Here there must be a force pushing it, which is P1 times A1. P1 being the pressure at state one, A1 is the area at state one. Well, it's a, it, let's assume the area doesn't change. So in that case here, the force that is pushing it this way, pressure is always a compressive force, it'll be P2 times A. And if you want to be realistic, you must say there must be some frictional forces. Well, it's difficult to evaluate, but there'll be some frictional force that opposes the fluid motion. Now the fluid is moving in this direction. So obviously, if it is not accelerating, there is no net force. And therefore, P1A must be slightly higher than P2A. Why? Because there must be some friction. So in general, one can conclude that P1 is greater than P2. So pressure actually drops along the flow when we apply Newton's law, that is, the fluid is not accelerating, so there is no net force, and therefore, if friction is present, P1 is greater than P2. So, while we heat a fluid, it is not, there is no way the pressure is going to increase. When we think like pressure increasing, because we are thinking of a closed volume. Remember, here the fluid is free to move. So, whenever we heat a fluid, it is never going to increase the pressure. If anything, you can show that the pressure drop will be slightly higher because of heating. So, in an ideal way, in an ideal case, when you say there is no friction, many a times we'll assume the pressure to remain constant. In other words, it will be called a constant pressure heating. Again, depending on if the gas is flowing through the pipe or a, a, a liquid is flowing through the pipe, we are going to use either the PG model or the or the PC model to evaluate the change in enthalpy. Okay, so let's briefly outline the PC model. 
In a PC model, on a TS diagram, a dome shape separates the superheated vapor from subcooled liquid and from the mixture which is liquid plus vapor. The most important thing to understand in a TS diagram for a PC model is that a constant pressure line looks something like this, a knee shaped diagram. And the higher the pressure, suppose pressure is 1000 kPa versus if the pressure is lower, let's say pressure is 10 kPa. So a lower pressure line looks like this, a higher pressure line looks like that. So in the example of heating a liquid, for instance, suppose state one is a state at the inlet and we keep heating the liquid then after the temperature rises to the boiling point which is called the saturation point the F point the temperature doesn't change anymore if you keep on adding heat then finally we reach saturated vapor state G state and then if you keep heating the liquid become superheated vapor so between F and G, we have a mixture of saturated liquid and vapor in this zone. Over here we have subcool liquid and here we have superheated vapor. To find properties of PC model, there are not many formulas. What we do, we go to the tables, find the properties of the saturated liquid and saturated vapor, in, and, and then figure out mixture properties. If it is a superheated vapor, we have tables, and if it is a subcooled liquid, then we go to a separate model called the compressed liquid model. And if you go to the property tables, then you can see in the PC model, say steam, R 134A, R 12, these are different fluids we are going to use. The saturation tables are here and the superheated tables are here. So essentially we'll be handling saturation table and superheated table quite a bit. If you click, you'll see the superheated table will come. If you, if you go to the saturation table, uh, the pressure saturation table will have pressure in the first column, whereas the temperature satur saturation column uh, table has temperature in the first column. That's the only difference between them. So you already fam you must be already familiar with how to find properties of a, a, a PC fluid. Now, if you think about what is a gas really, a superheated vapor, a gas essentially is a superheated vapor. If you can think of a gas as in a TS diagram, as a vapor which has been superheated to the extreme. So this is where a superheated vapor behaves like a gas. And the gas model that we are going to use is the PG model. We have already covered that in module, uh, module one. So here suffices to say that a constant pressure line on the TS diagram, the higher pressure line will be on top of a lower pressure line. So this is how a constant pressure line looks on the PG model. So if you think of how, say for instance, a turbine which handles gas will look like in a PG model. So if it's state one, it's an isentropic turbine, then that's how it will look on a TS diagram. So in a PG model, generally when you draw a TS diagram, we will not do the dome because we are far removed from it. So that's how the constant pressure lines will be indicated. So suppose this is P equals P1 and this is P equals P2, a lower pressure. This is state one. So this will be on the TS diagram a turbine 
uh, on if the if if it happens to be a PG model. On the other hand, if it's a PC model, the TS diagram suppose it's a steam turbine, a higher pressure line, a lower pressure line, and suppose this is my state one for the turbine. If it's isentropic turbine, that's how a TS diagram will look like for a steam turbine. The properties of for PG model again, you can go to the table module and you can see the PG model, the common gases properties such as R, C, P, C, V, K, etc. is given here. But the formulas for different models for that, as we mentioned in module one, remember the formula sheet table J1 uh, should be printed out. Whenever you solve a problem, the last page of this handout will carry uh, different formulas. So the, here is the PG model, as you can see. And the PC model, uh, also you'll find this will guide you regarding the PC model uh, right here. You can find the CL submodel again. When we solve problem, we'll come back here and remind you how to find properties of a liquid uh, while using the PC model. So we'll stop here and go back to an important concept of how to, what these graphs really mean. And for that, we have to go to an animation uh, this is a screen capture of an animation uh, for a internally reversible system. Well, the animation here shows a single flow system where mass is coming in and going out, and heat transfer is allowed, work transfer is allowed, shaft work transfer is allowed. Only one condition is applied here, that there is no friction inside. The system is internally reversible. Well, then we can extract a lot of meaning out of the TS diagram or the PV diagram of the device. So notice that the same flow is going through the system and the system then can be divided into small elements. So if I click on this element link, we are expanding the element same mass flow is going from system state one to two, which are very close to each other. Look at the TS diagram. One and two are very close to each other. So their difference between uh, entropy S2 minus S S1 can be infinitesimal, ds. So applying the energy, entropy equation on this element, uh, you recall that for steady state, ds dt goes to zero. But here we are allowing heat transfer in this device. And the entropy generation in this little element is ds, ds dot gen. In other words, very little bit of entropy is a little amount. Heat transfer is the d amount. So manipulating this equation, dq is given by the difference in s, remember, is just a little amount ds in this formula. But it brings out a beautiful graphical meaning. It shows that the heat transfer in this element is given by uh, the, the, the area the area under this graph from 1 to 2 times m dot. So t times ds is this area, rectangular area shown here. So therefore, for the entire device going from i to e, you, you have to just integrate this area. So going back to the device, you can see the meaning of the TS diagram now. If you can plot inlet and exit in any heating process, in this case, it's a constant pressure heating process, then the area underneath is proportional to the heat transfer. Again, this meaning will be used over and over again in the coming modules. Moving on to the external work transfer, we can extract similar meaning. Again, we'll employ the energy and entropy equation to an element one to one to two, through which the same mass is flowing but the contribution of this element to the work transfer is d amount, d w dot external. So the energy equation for this steady system reduces 
as follows. And here, the, the term dq dot, we substitute what we derive from the entropy equation. But without going into the details of the derivation, the final meaning is very striking. It says that the work output from this internally reversible device is given by VDP. What is VDP? The area that is subtended by the, by the diagram from 1 to 2 on this PV diagram on the p-axis. Well, there is contribution from kinetic and potential energy too, but as you know, they're generally negligible. So the work transfer assumes a nice meaning too. What is that? The external work transfer in a device is given by integral VDP. I cannot tell you how many times we'll come back, fall on this formula to understand why a gas turbine or a vapor power plant work. As you can already see, to understand this formula, what it really means is that the, the, the external work transfer involved in a device like this, it could be a compressor, it could be a turbine, is proportional to the area subtended on the PV diagram on the p-axis. Recall that the boundary work for a closed system was the area under the PV diagram on the v-axis. So in this case, it just totally get uh, transformed. You know, and it, it, in other words, all you have to remember is that area subtended by a PV diagram on the p-axis is proportional to the external work transfer. And that has a lot of practical significance. For example, suppose we have a turbine then the the work produced by the turbine W dot T is proportional to this area on a PV diagram. This is an isentropic line on the TH diagram and an isentropic line on the PV diagram looks something like this as shown here for a for a gas model, for a PG model. Now, suppose the question is, what will happen if the turbine inlet temperature goes up? We are not changing the inlet pressure on ex or exit pressure, the pressure remaining the same. So the inlet state will move to the right because if the temperature is higher, specific volume will be higher. So therefore, the entire line will shift. You can show that the entire line will become like this. And as you can see, the area will have increased if the inlet temperature goes up. And this is what is shown in this animation. If you increase the temperature, the sh line shifts to the right. And as a result, the net area has now increased and the turbine work will go up. So even though the turbine is operating under the same pressure difference, Pi to Pe, if you increase the inlet temperature, or the temperature of the gas flowing through the turbine, you will have more work. And you cannot explain that without an understanding of the PV diagram and the internally reversible device that we just, uh, just explained. On the same token, uh, let me show you another animation to explain why a pump why, why a pump consumes so much less work than a compressor. Again, on the PV diagram, a compress the compressor work will be given by the area that is swept by this graph in the PV diagram. Whereas if you go to the, if you have the same pressure rise in a pump, then as you can understand, the specific volume of a liquid is way smaller than that of a gas. And the amount of work that will be needed by a pump therefore is a whole lot lower. This is a concept that we're going to use over and over again. So to summarize, the area subtended by the PV diagram on the p-axis is proportional to the external work transfer, and the area subtended under the TS diagram is proportional to the heat transfer of an, op of an open steady device. Going back uh, to to the heating problem we discussed, uh, suppose we are heating a fluid from state 1 to state 2 
in a, that's a, in a boiler. Then the area underneath the TH diagram, this area is proportional to the heat transfer. Again, this will be a significant uh, development that we are going to use over and over again. Finally, we are going to cover a little bit of an actual turbine or an actual compressor versus an ideal or uh, isentropic compressor. Okay, let's first discuss a isentropic. Let's first discuss a turbine. Typically, we will draw a turbine in this manner with two different exit, exit state. Let me explain what I mean by that. State two will be the exit state corresponding to an ideal turbine, and three would be corresponding to an actual turbine. So the output from an ideal turbine would be is also known as an isentropic turbine, m dot h1 minus h2, and the actual turbine would be m dot h1 minus h3. As you may recall on a TS diagram, suppose we have a gas here flowing through the turbine, state 1, isentropic turbine, an ideal turbine will be something that will look like this, whereas in an actual turbine, there could be friction inside, and therefore, the entropy can be higher at the exit. Again, we covered that in the beginning of this lecture. So that's how an actual turbine and ideal turbine will look on a TS diagram. The isentropic efficiency or the turbine efficiency is defined as the ratio of the two. The smaller one goes to the top. Obviously, an actual turbine will produce smaller amount of work, so the definition will become as follows. So in other words, if you know the turbine efficiency and inlet state and exit state, then you can find the exit enthalpy from the definition of the isentropic efficiency. We can do exactly the same thing for a compressor. 